So in this evidences video, I'm going to talk about scientific principles that Joseph Smith had revealed to him well before they were discovered by scientists in modern day. Fascinating material. And in fact, I was really inspired by this from attending an Education Week uh, lecture series by Dr. John Lamb. He's been a chemistry professor, just retired. He's 36 years at BYU. Phenomenal. Lots of awards. And what was so exciting about it is he just wrote a book. And so I thought, oh, I can do a video on this now. Joseph Smith's 21st century view of the world. Truths he knew before the world accepted them. So it's a lot better from, than my Education Week notes uh, for trying to do a video anyway uh, in getting into the meat of things. So very exciting. Um, I highly recommend, though, going to that Education Week class. If you're ever able to get down there, it's phenomenal. One of the best I've ever seen of anything in my life. It's just fantastic. Um, I'm going to share uh, parts from, from the book throughout the video on the different topics. I'll also link in the end screen to two other videos that would be great on this. Uh, the video on explosions of light after 1830 and science and religion, seeing with both eyes, which would be a great uh, companion video uh, to this. So, Okay, so let's start out. Uh, Doctrine and Covenant section 121, Joseph's in Liberty Jail, and the Lord reveals to him that there will be a, a bunch of um, scientific principles that will be revealed essentially in this dispensation that have never been known throughout the history of the world. And it's interesting, he's, he's getting this in Liberty Jail uh, as though that was to be a comforting thing for the, for the saints. So it's fascinating. Uh, Dr. Lamb says this, Surely we'd all agree that knowledge of the gospel itself can comfort and inspire, but uh, can so-called secular knowledge do so as well? It should. That is, when you consider that all truth comes from God, he doesn't make the distinction between sacred and secular truth. To him it is all truth. In this work, as we pursue various topics together, I trust that you will find examples wherein both sacred and secular knowledge can be both a comfort and inspiration to you as it has been to me. Then he says, the coming forth of the gospel truth in the latter days has been paralleled by an explosion of scientific truth. In certain respects, these two fields of knowledge have found harmony since Joseph Smith's time in ways that only now are becoming to appreciate. This is the underlying theme of this work, his, his book. We are blessed to live in a day when knowledge is expanding and the veil of darkness, which obscured our vision of the true nature of the world and our place in it, for so many centuries is being lifted. We shall see in this work on several key points, Joseph Smith was remarkably prescient in his understanding of the natural world, anticipating the science that we have now come to understand in the 21st century. Okay, let's look at God's universe revealed. Moses 1, 28 and 29, And he, Moses, beheld also the inhabitants thereof, and there was not a soul which he beheld not. And he discerned them by the Spirit of God, and their numbers were great, even numberless as the sand upon the seashore. And he beheld many lands, and each land was called earth, and there were inhabitants on the face thereof. Now, Dr. Lamb talks about how in Joseph's day, uh, the Milky Way was considered to be the universe. So our, we understand that as just one of zillions of galaxies today. Uh, but at their day, they thought that was it. That was the entire universe. That was what scholars thought at that, at that point in time. So if you look today, um, it's fascinating. In fact, astronomers say you can see probably 10,000 stars or so with the naked eye. Um, but telescopes have been able to enhance our understanding of this, and uh, things have been changing quite dramatically. In fact, the big uh, catapult was this, was the launch of the Hubble Space Telescope. It's uh, 348 miles above the Earth, rotating around the Earth like a satellite and it was launched in 1990. And um, it, uh, one of the things that we found out as an example is uh, prior telescopes, uh, especially Joseph's day and, and uh, since, since then, they um, thought that there were these clouds, that they were just clouds essentially of dust and, and stars in the Milky Way. Um, what we found out from the Hubble telescope particularly was that these were other galaxies. <laughs> So um, now I want you to look at this this uh, little picture here on the screen of um, this was a 10-day uh, long exposure. The Hubble telescope pointed at the darkest patch in the sky they could find and did a 10-day long exposure to to zone in on this specific spot and look at what they found. Just numerous galaxies uh, in that in just that little spot. Phenomenal. Um, what 200 uh, billion stars in the Milky Way uh, galaxy and how many galaxies are in the universe? The estimates are pretty wide between 100 billion to 2 trillion. That's the range. And even some scientists are even talking about multiverse stacking of universes possibly um, or even galaxies within black holes. Uh, phenomenal things being talked about. Now in his television series Cosmos, a scientist who is not a believer in God, Carl Sagan, tries to help the viewer understand the enormous number of stars that modern science has revealed through instruments like the Hubble telescope. Lo and behold, he states that the number of stars in the known universe is greater 
the number of grains of sand on all the beaches of the planet Earth. In fact, uh, Dr. Lamb in, in, at Education Week, he actually showed us the math behind this, and it's, it's real. It's, it really is true. It is, it is rather astonishing to think that Joseph Smith understood the scope of the universe in the early 1800s well before science had revealed it. Just before his time, scientists like Kant and Herschel in Europe and Benjamin Franklin in, in America had been speculating about the existence of multiple worlds. But Joseph went further. In his works of Revelation, he made claims about the number of stars and planets that were outlandish and unsubstantiated in his day, and which held uh, him up for possible ridicule. He even claimed that there were countless inhabited planets as out, an outrageous proposition for the science of his day, but one which is now considered a serious possibility by respected scientists. In fact, until just a decade ago, we couldn't even answer this question. New technologies have made it possible to look for planets around other stars, and guess what? There are planets around nearly all of them, with several thousand planets discovered by the date of this writing, his book, in 2018. And to narrow the search further, what if we were to limit our research only to planets that orbit their stars in just the right place that they might have liquid water and therefore life? Researchers now estimate that billions of stars in our own galaxy have not just any planets, but planets in the so-called habitable zone capable of supporting life. Okay, let's look at uh, Dr. Kevin section 88 about kingdoms in space. All kingdoms have a law given and there are many kingdoms for there is no space in which there is no kingdom. There is no kingdom in which there is no space, either a greater or a lesser kingdom. And under every kingdom is given a law and under every law there are certain bounds also and conditions. Behold, all these are kingdoms and any man who has seen any of the least of these hath seen God moving in his majesty and power. But no kingdom in which there is no space. So in Joseph's day, um, this passage might have sound rather grand. It probably didn't make sense to anyone, uh, especially the scientific community, um, they thought that, especially when you look at out in space and see all these different objects, that there um, was this massless foggy material uh, called the luminar luminiferous aether <laughs> um, there that was their uh, nature of whores of vacuum, Aristotle famously said. Um, and also they thought that there needed to to exist for um, light to pass, uh, to travel through as a wave to make its way between objects in space. Um, also, the atom they saw as just um, basically filled completely. Uh, they were just starting to learn about the atom, but they thought there was no void within an atom, which would upset Aristotle as well. So. Um, it's fascinating to see our science uh, catching up with uh, this concept now. Um, so first of all, space is everywhere out there. When we look out there, it's very empty. In fact, the closest uh, star to our sun, which is Alpha Centauri, is four uh, light years away. One light year, six trillion miles. So uh, how fa fast, how long uh, a light uh, travels in a year. So think about that, 24 uh, trillion miles plus away. Um, and then, so if you, if you were to look at it, uh, the universe is 99.99999% uh, empty space. Our galaxy is about 100,000 light years across. Think about that, one light year, six trillion miles. Um, the nearest galaxy to us, I love to look at this in my telescope, the Andromeda galaxy, two and a half million light years away. That's the nearest galaxy to us. What about the atom? Empty empty space. There's the uh, nucleus in the middle, but it's about one one hundred thousandth of the atom. That's fascinating. So fluff, empty space. Fascinating uh, there. Now we know that. So 99.99% uh, volume of the atom is empty space. As Dr. Lamb kept putting, Aristotle loses again. Uh, so he, uh, here's what Dr. Lamb says. So in a nutshell, even the tiny percentage of the universe occupied by matter itself it's almost completely empty space. It turns out the universe we know is composed mostly of nothing. And that's something no one imagined in Joseph Smith's day. In his day, to claim that there is no kingdom in which there is no space seemed to make no sense. Today, it surely does. Now, no space in which there is no kingdom. Dr. Lamb said, as a scientist, it seems pretty clear to me that Joseph is using the word kingdom in a very generic sense to refer to any physical realm of existence, be it in outer space or inner space, be it a galaxy, a planet, or an atom. What then does he mean when he states that there is no space in which there is no kingdom? Joseph taught that there are many things in the universe beyond what we can perceive with our natural senses. One of these is the so-called spirit of God. He speaks of this spirit or light as a substance that proceeds forth from the presence of God to fill the immensity of space. There is a certainty, plenty of room for it. There's certainly plenty of room for it between the atoms and the stars. What does science now teach us about the space within atoms and the galaxies? Lots. Much of it's speculative at this point. First, just in the last few decades, scientists have postulated that huge amounts of dark matter and dark energy must exist. Now, dark matter, what is it? We don't know. That's why we call it dark matter. But we know that it's there 
from a science uh, perspective, there isn't enough mass in the stars, planets, gas, and dust in each of the galaxies to, to essentially um, have the gravity hold uh, the galaxy together. So there's this mass that must be made up. Uh, so scientists have postulated there's a lot of extra mass that we can't see. We can't even detect it with an instrument. So they just labeled it dark matter. Now dark energy, when you look, especially at the Hubble Space Telescope, you see galaxies moving away from each other. Gravity should be pulling them together. They're moving away and they're accelerating. So they talk about this energy that we can't see. It's dark, dark energy uh, that's there as well. Now look at this pie chart. Um, if scientists have postulated today, this is about the mix. 68.3% dark energy, 26.8% dark matter, and about 5% ordinary matter. Dr. Lamb said this, is this in his book. It turns out that if scientists are interpreting the observations correctly, dark matter and dark energy must make up about 95% of all that there is in the universe. What a disappointment. All this time we thought we had a huge progress in understanding the natural world, and it turns out we have been looking at only 5% of it all along. What we are learning from these developments is that just because our senses and our instruments fail to detect things, just because we can't see them, doesn't mean they don't exist. In fact, science takes it on faith that they do exist because we can see their effects. Perhaps we should be more willing to give the claims of religion the same benefit. And I love what he says here. Dark matter and dark energy uh, presumably exist, spread throughout creation at varying concentrations in various places, probably all around you at this very moment, even though you can't see them or feel them, invisible to us because they don't interact with normal matter the way normal matter interacts with itself. They would pass right through you without you even knowing. Joseph Smith taught that the spirit world was not in some distant spot in the universe, but right here and around us. For a long time after, this idea was ridiculed as completely incompatible with scientific knowledge. No longer. Not only do we know there's plenty of space for other kingdoms besides our own right here, but now physicists themselves are talking about previously unknown materials residing right amid what is all around us. And now he's careful. He says, I'm not proposing that dark matter is spirit or that spirit world is made of dark matter. What I am saying is that whereas Joseph's religious claims of a spirit world right here previously made no sense scientifically, now these claims are perfectly compatible with science. Okay, now each kingdom is given a law, certain uh, bounds and conditions. What's fascinating, I'll let you, you can look at this slide, but basically what they're saying is um, there are all these laws that science has figured out, but there's a big disconnect between large objects and small objects. It's, it's really interesting, and it shouldn't be that way, but it is. And so every kingdom uh, has laws, and there's certain bounds and conditions, just like the verse says. Fascinating. We now understand this. He says that the end of this insight expressed in Scripture at a time when none of this, this science was understood or even imagined. <laughs> Okay, now lastly of, of that, uh, those verses we were talking about, any, anyone who has seen the least of these kingdoms has seen God moving in his majesty and power. So think about this, a grain of sand, the least of these, um, has more atoms than there are stars in the universe. Not the galaxy, the universe. Phenomenal. Um, now think about our bodies. Um, in fact, here's what Dr. Lamb said, Bef befitting a child of God, your body is the most complex system in the world universe, in the whole universe. The, the more we learn about the cells that make you up and the biochemical processes that make you function, the more awe-inspiring you become. Every cell in your body is an amazing little world of its own with gates and walls, with sophisticated chemical factories, with the central government and a complex communication system. Okay, light. Let's talk about light. So there's a couple of great scriptures on light. Now there's 456 times where light is talked about in the standard works, 195 of these in Latter-day Saints scripture. Um, modern scripture and revelation clarify the nature of light significantly over what we can learn from the Bible. One particular salient verse in the Doctrine and Covenants, the, the word of the Lord is truth, and whatsoever is truth is light, and whatsoever is light is spirit, even the spirit of Jesus Christ. Section 88, 67, And if your eye be single to my glory, your whole body shall be filled with light, and there shall be no darkness in you. And that body which is filled with light comprehendeth all things. Section 131, verses 7 and 8, There is no such thing as immaterial matter. All spirit is matter, but is more fine or pure, and can only be discerned by purer eyes. We cannot see it. But when our bodies are purified, we shall see that it is all matter. This passage defines spirit and light as one aspect of spirit to be a material substance. Calling it fine implies that it is made up of very fine particles. The fact that it is seen with pure eyes fits well with the concept that spirit is like light in its character, hence the close relationship between the two. Okay, section 88, six, verses 6 through 13 talks about um, he that ascended up on high is also he that ascended below all things in that he comprehended all things that he might be in, in and through all things, the light of truth, which truth 
truth shineth. That is, this is the light of Christ. Is also he is in the sun, and he's in the earth. All these things, and he says, um, "The earth you see, and the light which shineth, which giveth you light, is through him who enlighteneth your eyes, which is the same light that quickeneth your understandings, which light proceedeth forth from the presence of God to fill the immensity of space. The light which is in all things, which giveth life to all things, which is the law by which all things are governed. Even the power of God who sitteth upon his throne, who is the bosom of eternity, who is the midst of all things." So, in summary, modern revelation teaches us that light. Light is a kind of spirit matter that the two terms are often used interchangeably, that it is material composed of fine particles, that it fills the immensity of space, that it is in all things and gives them law and life, that it constitutes the very power of God emanating forth from him to all his creations. Okay, there's three things about light to talk about just um, quickly. Uh, particle or wave. So I'll just flash this up on there. You can read the whole thing if you want. Wait, the wave model was considered the winner in Joseph's day. Um, the uh, with the um, understanding of quantum mechanics and things can only be, be broken down so far uh, called quantized that became uh, applied to light and they called it photons these particles and so uh, light was determined to be a particle uh, just as joseph said now um, they also uh, science uh, today has agreed it can be considered a particle and a wave by some uh, observations but definitely particulate in nature um, so kind of fascinating there for what uh, Joseph said about that. Now, I love this. Joseph, lo more more light than the eye can see. Um, look at this spectrum on the screen here. As, so what we see is only a broad uh, spectrum of the kind of light that exists. Most kinds of light are invisible to us. It's fascinating to think too that we actually glow like a light bulb, if you could see, uh, with infra infrared light. Um, and then look at it. It turns out that everything in the universe radiates light of some energy, even things that are very cold. Fascinating when you think about the scriptures we just read. Okay, now this is my favorite one. This is absolutely fascinating. And I won't go into the chemistry here. Um, Dr. Lamb did it in his class heavily, but um, about electromagnetism and all these discoveries that they found to understand the working of the atom here. But the key part, part of this was the discovery. Look at the last line there. Further, in the 20th century, we came to understand that light in the form of photons is the carrier of this force. It is the means by which particles exchange information with each other so that they can interact with each other the way they do. Light is what actually makes us to be able to understand things. It's phenomenal. And th so think back on that verse, DNC 88, and the light which shineth with giveth you light is through him who enlighteneth your eyes, which is the same light that quickeneth your understandings. Dr. Lamb says, I probably read this verse many times before it finally struck me that the seemingly obscure and rather odd statement made perfect sense from a modern scientific point of view. It says that the same light which we see with our eyes also works in our brains to allow us to think and to understand. Is that true? Yes, by the principles of modern science, but it didn't make a whole lot of sense in Joseph Smith's lifetime. So, um, and then he, so then in the book he talks about how just the process of seeing a flower and how it all works with this chemistry and, and the, the photons of light carrying it to your brain and understanding. Then he says all the steps in this in the process from the origination of the light in the flower to the final processing in your brain to recognize it as a flower involve the same natural principle, electromagnetism, the chemistry of emitting and absorbing light, the transmission of that light through space, and the transmission of electrical signals to nerve and brain cells are all electromagnetic processes working on a common principle. If you look back at that verse in section 88, you will notice that the, this concept is perfectly consistent with what is taught there. The light we see with our eyes is the same as that which enlivens our brains and allows us to think. Joseph didn't know these things at the time. No one did. Because <laughs> the principles of electromagnetism that govern the behavior of photons and electrons, atoms and ions, hadn't yet been discovered. Okay, let's talk about the God of nature. So, lots of fun stuff here. So, um, there's two particular principles found in traditional Christian uh, theology, uh, important for our discussion here concerning this. Um, number one, God is found outside of nature. He exists above it and independent of it. He created natural law, but can contravene it at any point he wishes. And number two, God is utterly unknowable. He is beyond the capability of the human mind to understand. Now look what I've underlined here. Joseph Smith's day, almost every denomination of Christendom thought like this. So Joseph, revolutionary Joseph's revelations were concerning the nature of God. Joseph's theology concerning the nature of God brings him back into the natural universe and makes him a participant in rather than apart from nature. 
They also talk about the so-called God in the gaps. As science reveals more about the true workings of nature, there is less and less need for a God to explain the parts of nature we don't understand. As the gaps diminish, so does the need for God. Restored Church recognizes no such gaps. The Father we worship is not above nature, but one with nature, and every natural law he reveals to us through science is simply another step in understanding him and his ways. Then look on the next page here, uh, just the underlying Christian theology, the God who exists above nature may be seen to intervene into the natural course of things. A supernatural event has occurred, a miracle, because it's supernatural, the root meaning being above nature. Can you see how this description of the world would be frustrating to scientists? The very basis of the scientific approach assumes that nature is underpinned by immutable laws that apply in all places and times. Scientists and others see this as a reason for finding religion insupportable. Joseph Smith's theology, we find God existing in nature. And to finish this, he says, do, do members of the restored church believe in miracles or not? Yes, but in our own unique way. We believe that God has the power to make unusual things happen, but not because he sidesteps natural law. When asked how a miracle happens, traditional theology might claim that it is a mystery, by which it meant me, not only that we don't know, but also that we can never know because we cannot probe the mind and acts of an inscrutable God. Latter-day Saints don't believe in mysteries in the same way. How a miracle happens may be a mystery, but only in the sense that we have not been told how the miracle was performed and what laws of nature were used to make it happen. And this difference in our understanding of miracles results directly from the different way we understand the nature of God. I love this. This He shared this from John A. Widso in his book, Joseph Smith is a Scientist. Three points. In Mormon theology, there is no place for immaterialism. Science knows phenomena only as they are associated with matter. Mormonism does the same. Two, in his conception of God, Joseph Smith was strictly scientific. He departed from the notion that God is a being foreign to nature and wholly superior to it. And three, a miracle simply means a phenomenon not understood in its cause and effect relations. The teachings of Joseph Smith that God exists in nature while acting as its supreme governor by way of natural law are in perfect harmony with the scientific approach in the wor to the world. Okay, so let's talk about time for a minute. So you probably know these f familiar scriptures, DNC 130 verse 4 um, and Abraham 3 talking about uh, time, God's time versus man's time uh, being different and, um, by quite a bit. Uh, but I love this, especially um, when it talks about uh, W.W. Phelps quoting Joseph Smith in the Times and Seasons. Um, Joseph says, look at the very end there, um, the length of, of uh, time going on in this system, almost two thousand five hundred fifty five millions of years clearly joseph had no problem thinking of creation not in terms of thousands of years but billions and i'll say uh just uh, the, at the time um the uh, christian community really believed in the literalness of the bible <laughs> that the, the uh, creation happened over seven days and the earth had been around for about six thousand years that was the common thinking now geologists were starting to explore and think much longer than that but definitely not uh, churchmen essentially the uh, Christian um, understandings, even today actually for many, uh, will still take that approach. So um, if you look at this, Joseph had kept the word day in his retranslation re of Genesis found in the book of uh, Moses, but in the parallel account in Abraham, he found the word time to be more appropriate than day um, on there. And his the critical nature was the, just the process, orderly step, and, and it can be what, however the length of time needed to be. Um, but an orderly process. There is another interesting aspect of time we learned after, long after Joseph's death and opens up insights into the nature of time itself. This newly discovered aspect of time influences how time appears to different observers in our universe. It is not as simple as the differences between planetary orbits or the rates of planetary revolution. Instead, it deals with the differences in the way time appears to progress from one observer to the next. You may remember this is called the Einstein's theory of relativity. The rate at which time passes is relative to the observer who may measures it. And so it's fascinating to consider that. And the science, uh, he gives, Dr. Lamb gives examples of that. He says it's clear that both science and Joseph Smith's theology speak of time as relative in certain senses. And on this point, both sides can certainly agree. In Joseph's day, much was understood about the difference in time between planets as related to their orbits and rates of rotation. But the more advanced concepts related to geological time and Einstein's ideas were yet to be discovered. The relatively few references to time in Joseph's sermons and revealed scriptures are certainly forward-looking and compatible with 21st century scientific theories about time and space. Okay, cosmos and chaos. Now this one is oh, a little crazy, but um, so 2 Nephi 
2 verse 11 uh, needs to be that there is an opposition in all things Lehi says um, on there if not so my firstborn in the wilderness righteousness could not be brought to pass neither wickedness neither holiness nor misery neither good nor bad it must needs remain as dead having no life neither death nor corruption or incorruption happiness nor misery so um, Dr. Lamb talks about the law of thermodynamics, which uh, there's two big parts of that. The first law, total amount of energy is unchanged. Um, it's constant in, uh, in the universe. And then the second law, and this is the important one for this, is um, it, opposition in all things, is that the law states that every event that occurs in nature increases the amount of disorder in the universe. He gives lots of examples in the book of this. Um, there, but how this also ties back to Lehi and what Lehi is saying um, on there. So I'll let you just look at the screen. Um, you can pause it if you want. Mosiah 319, the natural man is an enemy to God. Um, fascinating when you consider it uh, in this respect. And so if we look at this last uh, page on this, clearly as participants in nature, human beings are as susceptible to the workings of the second law of thermodynamics as everything else. Our physical selves and actions are by nature more prone to favor the forces of chaos than those of cosmos the forces of destruction over the forces of creation. It takes an extra measure of power to fulfill the requirements to be a saint, the champion of order, and to overcome the natural man, the champion of disorder. That power comes by way of the Spirit of God, which, when infused into the equation, can overwhelm the powers of entropy, chaos, that pull us down. And this is the greatest gift that Christ has offered us, in that he has the power to overwhelm the forces of darkness and destruction that dominate the natural process of death, both physical and spiritual. He has the power to lift us beyond the reach of the second law into a plane of existence that allows not only for the absence of chaos in our lives, but to an eternal endowment of cosmos or creative power. Good news of the gospel taking on a profound new insight when seen in the light of the laws of thermodynamics. So these principles of thermodynamics were not known in Joseph Smith's day. This law and its interpretation in terms of the atomic nature of matter was developed in Europe during the latter half of the 19th century, long after Joseph's death. Yet in this respect, Joseph's theology and science find common ground. Their teachings are complementary. Furthermore, the clear expression of the doctrine of opposition in all things in the Book of Mormon is one unique aspect of Joseph Smith's view of Christian theology. It is unique in the sense that Joseph's vision of the universe encompasses a heaven and heavenly beings, not divorced from the dichotomy of cosmos and chaos, but operating always in concert with the struggle between these opposing primal forces. Okay, the last big concept, and then I'll give you this amazing summary uh, at the end uh, from Dr. Lamb, opposition and free will. And this is part of that uh, uh, second Nephi, again, opposition in all things. But Lehi goes on and he says, um, and if the, these things are not, there is no God. And if there is no God, we are not, neither the earth, for there could have been no creation of things, neither to act nor to be acted upon. It must needs be that there was an opposition, wherefore the Lord God gave unto man that he should act for himself. Wherefore man could not act for himself, save it should be that he was enticed by the one or the other. Clearly the principles of opposition applies broadly among God's creations and is the eternal principle upon which our very existence is based. Yet the perfect goodness of a God outside nature generates a dilemma for an underlying principle in traditional Christian theology, that God created the universe from nothing and created each man and woman initially and completely at birth. Thus the question arises, how could a perfectly good God intentionally create evil in the world and in man? This question has vexed Christian theologians for 2,000 years. By contrast, Joseph Smith solves this problem neatly. <laughs> Quote, the mind of the intelligence which man possesses is co-equal with God himself. Joseph Fielding Smith clarifies that by co-equal, Joseph means co-eternal. Thus, each person has always existed in some form and thus can act independent of God's will. Man cannot point to a primal creator as responsible for his choices. We cannot blame God for our imperfect choices. Furthermore, according to Lehi's teaching, good and evil have always existed and are part of the underlying fabric of the universe as fundamental to the universe as time and matter themselves. God exists and we exist only because the opposites he describes are at play. Now, I'm just going to flash this up on the screen for a second. Look at this. The creation story itself, um, opposites or contrasting alternatives, fascinating. Lots of things that light and dark, sea and dry land, man and woman, life and death. Interesting. Even the principle of opposition in science at the bottom. You'll see this broadly apply positive and negative charges, uh, north and south poles on magnets uh, as an example. So he, he spends a lot of time in the book on this. Okay, now the last couple parts of this, um, the electrons have been found um, to have uncertainty and unpredictability, which was astonishing and not part of the science of Joseph's day. And in fact, in Joseph's day, it was thought to have really have been 
um, that you, if you knew the formulas, you could basically predict all that was going to happen um, on there. You just needed to know the equations and the math, essentially. But it created kind of a deterministic uh, uh, predestination uh, to, and, and um, essentially took away free will and accountability in some ways, uh, robbed people of faith and religion in that sense. And uh, it's noteworthy that therefore the Book of Mormon and Joseph Smith take a stand in favor of free will going against the then current scientific view. Um, but in the 20th century, with the advent of quantum mechanics, human thought processes can occur in the brain by means of electrical impulses, at the root of which is the behavior of electrons and atoms. You can't be certain what tiny particles like electrons will do due to the uncertainty principle. Suddenly, science and religion are no longer at odds. Our every decision cannot be predicted. We can choose whether or not to sleep in on a Saturday morning that our choice was not predetermined. We can choose to love or hate our neighbor, not because the motions of our atoms led us to an inevitable mechanical conclusion, but freely. In this respect, the restored church and science have found common ground with a tip of the hat to free will leaving us responsible for the actions we pursue. And in science, with the advent of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle in the 20th century, one is left with the question, if choice is not predetermined by physics, how then does it come about? Science has no answer. So we have to turn to religion and the possibility of a world apart from that which the eye can see. Joseph Smith's vision of the world anticipated future science. It took a century to pass before modern science opened up the possibility of uncertainty at the atomic level, the very level at which intelligent thought has its source. And so once again, an apparent conflict between Joseph's theology and the science of the day was resolved with new discoveries in science after his time. And Dr. Lamb says, I exercise my agency by choosing to see this as another testimony of Joseph's divine insights. And with that, I want to finish with his summary. It's, it's phenomenal. Love it. He wraps it up by saying, in summary, Joseph's God-given revelations anticipated the following. The vastness of God's creations of stars and inhabited worlds, the degree to which only later did science begin to uncover. The existence of spirit and unseen worlds contiguous to our own, defied by the science of his day, but perfectly compatible with 21st century understanding of the world of matter and light. The nature of life and its relationship to life and intelligent thought far in advance of the science of his day. The roles of opposing forces of good and evil as they relate to the forces of cosmos and chaos in nature with greater clarity than ever before. A resolution to the age-old paradox of free will and accountability, teaching that man is co-eternal with God, while science of his day implied that the universe of man were mechanical in nature, that free will was an illusion. Not until the following century did science understand that the universe is not mechanical, but that uncertainty is a property of nature that opens the door to the concept of free will. The possibility of an earth billions of years old and the concept of relative time long before Einstein enlarged on these ideas. He encourages saints to seek out all that is virtuous, lovely, or good report of praiseworthy. And his successor, Brigham Young, made it clear that science is a reliable source of such things to be embraced, which is something I did in the religion and science uh, video, seeing with both eyes. I hope you enjoyed the video. I had a lot of fun putting it together. Buy Dr. Lamb's book. I'll tell you, go to Education Week, see his class. It's phenomenal. Hope you enjoyed it. Subscribe for more.